everyone. Thank you for joining us here tonight. Welcome back to whoever's joining us for a second time. Just for those who don't know about our agency, at Applied ABC, we offer ABA services for children and adults with autism. We offer a free assessment and thereafter ABA services, all supervised by uh, BCBA. Tonight's workshop is on behavior interventions and functional analysis presented by Lana Bavaro. Lana has been in the field of special education for 20 years and she has been, she is a BCBA, a board certified behavior analyst since 2003. So Lana will introduce herself further. Thank you so much. How many of you are, just get a little bit of a sample, how many of you are special educators? Okay, BCBAs? Any parents? Other related service providers? <laughs> Very good. So in addition to being a behavior analyst, as Dina mentioned, I'm a special ed teacher. And I became a special ed teacher 20 years ago. It's actually 20 years right now on the marking. And you know, it's a, you have to say to yourself, why do we go into the field of special education? It's really a calling for us. I was very fortunate that I was able to graduate from high school early, and I was accepted into NYU, a very prestigious university, and I told my family, I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm going to NYU to be a lawyer. So I went there at 16 years old and sat in a room of thousands and thousands of people, and they give you an application to fill out where you declare your major code after code after code, hundreds of teeny tiny little codes, and I'm looking for something in law to kind of like trigger a spark interest for myself. And I find the code for special education, and I circled it, and I sent in my application, and I went home and I said to my mother, just want to let you know I'm not going to be a lawyer. I decided to be a special ed teacher. And she said, oh. So still to this day I have an aunt that thinks I'm a lawyer because 20 years ago. But I, I really had the good fortune of Back in the 90s, you were able to become a special ed teacher with just a bachelor's degree. But I enjoyed education, and I wanted to further my education, so I obtained the master's and fell into behavior analysis. I went to a very, very small school that said, we have five children in this class that are not learning. We're going to try something new with them. It's called ABA. Have you heard of it? That I said, no, I haven't heard of ABA. Have you ever worked with children with autism? No. Back then, the statistics were 1 in 10,000 children were being diagnosed on the autistic spectrum. Now I've heard that the up-and-coming results are 1 in 42 for boys, which is significant. We do have an epidemic on our hands. So back in the 90s, when it was 1 in 10,000, I had read one chapter in one book about autism. And I sat down to work with a little boy that is still my student today. He's turning 22. And I did this method called applied behavior analysis, and I taught him at a point. And I said, oh my goodness, I, I just taught this child how to do something. I taught him how to point to indicate what he wants. And I just fell in love with the methodology and with the population, and I just con continued to advance my knowledge base by becoming an administrator, becoming a behavior analyst, and just doing my best to always serve our community of families. So that's why when Dean is saying, oh, all the families love me, it's because it's come, everything comes from, from our heart when we do this. We're doing it for the greater good of the child. We are providing a therapy now that our insurance companies recognize that what we do is therapeutic treatment as opposed to education. And we are building a brain. But in order to build that brain, we have to get through a multitude of behaviors. So what I asked, when I was asked to present, I said, Please, let me present on functional behavior assessments and how to really pinpoint what's happening, why is it happening, and what can we do about it. Because once we eradicate those problem behaviors, then we could have an open opportunity to teach skill building. I decided to call this a functional analysis and not a functional analysis of problem behaviors because we're not only targeting behaviors that are of difficulty for children or maladaptive behaviors, we're also looking to increase behaviors. So some of this is going to be about how to eradicate problem behaviors that interfere with learning, but then on the flip side, it's also going to be about how to increase those behaviors that are appropriate that we're looking to build upon skill level for our students. When we look at a behavior, we need to analyze it. That's our job as behavior analysts and as special ed teachers, to figure out why the behavior is occurring. When I became a behavior analyst in 2003, I had the 
great opportunity to work with Dr. Iwata. He taught courses for in, in the college that I attended, and what he created was this functional assessment screening tool, which is the only handout that I'm giving to you. The first thing that we look at is, what is the behavior? How do we define it? We're defining the behavior. See how it says it has to be observable and measurable? It's a very hard thing to always do that. Sometimes we see a child and we say, oh, he's sad. Can't observe and measure sadness. Oh, he might be hungry. Maybe he's hungry. Maybe he's tired. Maybe, maybe he didn't sleep well last night. Maybe he's getting a, a molar. We don't know. But those things affect behavior, but they're not observable and measurable behaviors. So I'll, when, I, when I go through the presentation, I'm going to talk to you about how to really define what it is that we're looking at so anyone can walk off the street and know exactly the behavior that's being targeted by either the behavior analyst or the special ed teacher or, or the parent. We need to identify that behavior and then we're going to look at the why. Why is it actually happening? And is it a behavior that we're looking to increase or a behavior that we're looking to decrease? Of course, behaviors that we would want to decrease might be self-injurious behaviors, a child that bites themselves or bangs their head into it. Um, behaviors that we want to increase is expressive language use or functional play skills. The four conditions help us to determine the particular behavior, why that particular behavior is occurring. So the first thing we look at, and it's all in the functional assessment tool that I gave you, is, is this a behavior that occurs in the alone condition? But how would we know that? When the child is completely alone, in a room, by himself, or the parent is off to the side and the child doesn't know that the parent is there, is he exhibiting a particular behavior? You might see a behavior such as a child sitting on the floor and rocking in an alone condition. In addition to that, we're looking to see is, is the behavior done to seek attention of others? So think about, it's for those of you that have your own children, as soon as you get on the phone, you have your little one tugging on your skirt, mommy, mommy, mommy. Why? They want to get your attention. Are they doing a particular behavior to seek your attention? So those are two conditions that we look at. The alone condition, or does this particular behavior seek attention of others? Sometimes a child might fall out in class. That's a behavior that seeks attention of others. It's a behavior that we're looking to decrease, of course, and we're looking to substitute it with a more appropriate behavior, such as raising their hand. We're also looking to see if one of the conditions might be gaining access to a tangible. For example, I want that. In order for me to get that, I have to do certain things. So is it always to gain access to something that the child desires? Okay. And the, the fourth one is escaping the demand. And also, as special education teachers, we see that quite often. I present a demand to the child. The child wants to escape the demand of work. So what does he do? Maybe he lopes from the area. Maybe he throws the blocks onto the floor. There's many, many things that a child might do to escape the demands of work. So many behaviors could be understood by function, the function of these particular three events, antecedent behavior consequence. So for those of you that are doing ABA, we use this antecedent behavior consequence as a form of discrete trial teaching. So discrete trial teaching is your SD, your discriminative stimulus, your response the child gives and the consequence. When we look at behaviors, we're doing the same thing because everything is a behavior. We're looking to see what occurred the antecedent directly before the behavior. What is the behavior and what's the consequence? Now, I don't want you to think of consequence as a bad thing. Consequence is just something that occurs immediately after the behavior. It could be something positive, it could be something negative, it could be something punitive. We don't know until we actually observe the, the particular behavior that we have, we're trying to observe and measure. One thing I want to mention is that, and it's not in your handout, but when we look at the four conditions to determine the behavior, why the behavior is occurring, sometimes a behavior will occur in multiple conditions. So it might be one particular behavior, but it serves multiple functions. It's to escape the demands of work and get attention. It's something that might be to escape the demands of work and also in an alone condition or to gain access to a tangible. So you will see a lot of overlap. When we're identifying a problem behavior, so now we're going to touch upon problem behaviors and not behaviors that we're looking to increase. Does it look socially inappropriate? So problem behavior that occurred in a school I worked one time is the child liked to wear his coat all day long, a hood, a sweater,
sweater, winter, spring, summer, fall, did not matter. It looked socially appropriate. So in the grand scheme of things, it's so terrible. You know, is this a behavior that we really want to address? Well, when it starts to interfere with his ability to be socially accepted, it's a yes. We do want to eradicate that particular problem behavior because it's isolating the child. He's the child that always wears his hood and his sweater. And then other children don't want to interact with him appropriately because they feel like it's an, a behavior that's atypical. Does it interfere with learning? For those of us that are special ed teachers, we see tons and tons of behavior that interfere with the child's ability to learn. And we might say, oh, he's not focused, he's not attending, but what is it that he's really doing that's interfering with his ability to learn? So we might have a student that engages in self-stimulatory behavior, trying to teach him to play appropriately with the car, but he likes to turn the car over and spin the wheels. Very common behavior for those of our students that are on the autistic spectrum. So that's something that does interfere with his ability to learn how to play appropriately because what he's doing is flipping the car over and spinning the wheel. So now he's not moving the car on the floor, putting the little man in the car and moving the man up the slide. Does it cause harm to others? Is the child aggressive towards other children? It's a possibility that we're observing a behavior that might do that. Does it cause harm to the child itself? So you might be looking at your student. Some of us have students that, that bite themselves as a particular behavior. And it's something that's called an SIB or a self-injurious behavior. Of course, those are the first. First and foremost, we target those behaviors that are self-injurious and harmful to others. And then we focus on behaviors that might be interfering with lear learning or socially inappropriate. And then, of course, there's destruction of property. Does the child like to tear things off of the wall? That's destruction of property. Or whenever you give them a piece of paper to color, they crumble it up and throw it to the side or tear it up. So these are some problem behaviors that you might, that I find to be common problem behaviors that you might be identifying when you're working with your particular student. So just as, as I briefly touched upon, some socially inappropriate behaviors might be hand flapping, rocking, talking to oneself. Um, tongue clicking, mouthing items. These are all <clears throat> these are all behaviors that we look to um, eliminate over time. Some behaviors that might interfere with learning, lack of eye contact, very common for our students. They're not looking, many times they're not attending. If they're not attending, how do we expect them to actually respond to the direction that we're given? Throwing items on the floor, mouthing items. So you see, one particular behavior, like mouthing an item, could be something that is socially inappropriate as well as interfere with the child's learning because how is he playing appropriately if he's constantly putting the items into his mouth? And then, of course, there's uh, causing harm to others, such as hitting or hair pulling or kicking. And these are, behavior, these are types of behaviors that we look to, to eliminate over time once we could identify them. Thank you. Self-injurious behaviors. Possible self-injurious behaviors, biting oneself, pulling out hair, scratching, um, picking at their fingers or picking at their skin. And then, of course, there's destruction of property like tearing up cars or pulling items from the wall, throwing chairs and desks, which is some things that you might see with children and an, an older population. Thank you. So how do we reduce these behaviors? This is really why we're here. We want to identify them, and we want to find a way to reduce them or eliminate them completely. So once we conduct <clears throat> Excuse me, a functional behavior assessment and determine the function, then we could start to decrease these behaviors. So we want to do that by teaching replacement skills. So many times you'll notice when you're looking at a functional behavior treatment plan, it'll say, I want to eliminate particular behaviors, but I want to replace them with something else. So I want to eliminate mouthing of pieces of a toy and replace it with having the child actually put them into the toy. So we always try to do our best to teach replacement skills. Uh, if a child hits to get the, the teacher's attention, we teach the child to request appropriately by either calling their name, raising a hand, tapping, using an augmentative device. That's what we, that's what we really want to do. We really want to always work on increasing behavior. I was just writing up a, a treatment plan, and I, and I noticed that you know, we, we typically put down all the things that the child is doing wrong. So he's... he's He's hitting, and he's throwing, and he's eloping, and he's tearing, and eloping is running away from the work area. And 
writing away, writing. So when, I, when I'm designing these treatment plans, I'm always trying to put a positive spin on it. You know, instead of saying I want to decrease the amount of times, the frequency that the child runs away from the work area, I want to increase the amount of time he's actually in the chair. So that's what we're talking about, replacing problem behaviors with functional, functional skills for the child. Thank you. Increasing on-task behavior. If a child mounts a piece to a puzzle, we teach the child how to put the pieces into a puzzle or the form board. That's trying to develop appropriate play skills for the particular child by decreasing all that off-task behavior. Um, be, the behavior plans must be followed sp as specifically as they're written because we are analyzing data. That's what we do as behavior analysts. We create this functional treatment plan and we look at all the information that is collected from related service providers, from parents, from special ed teachers, from our paraprofessionals that are providing treatment now. And we take this information and it helps us to really modify the treatment plan. So they have to be done specifically because if we're not providing accurate and accurate assessment of the behavior we're looking at, then the intervention is not going to be effective. So the behavior plan must be documented, it must be reviewed and modified when needed. Treatment plans are only effective if we can actually implement them. So if we have a great idea for a treatment plan that we think is going to be effective and it's not possible to actually <coughs> implement it, then what's the point of it if it can't be done? Before I talk about reinforcement, I'm going to talk to you about a treatment plan, just give you a little scenario. I went to observe a fifth grader recently in a school exhibiting an array of off-task behaviors. And the teacher of the group, it was a small group of eight kids, some special needs, some typical developing. For 25 minutes, he tried, to the best of his ability, to teach a particular lesson. But unfortunately, he spent his time managing problem behaviors. And instead of following through with what it was that he wanted, he just repeated himself over and over and over again. So the child had a water bottle. Six out of the eight kids in the group had a water bottle, but the particular student that I was observing was tapping and tapping and tapping and tapping and tapping the water bottle. And the parent sent me in to see this child because he's not doing so well in school. He has a lot of problem behaviors that are interfering with the teacher's ability to teach and his ability to learn. So very simple. He's banging, he's banging, he's banging, he's rolling it, he's drinking from it. He's and No, okay. no he's not. He's a 10-year-old boy that is has an IEP for other needs, he's not on the spectrum, but he's demonstrating this particular behavior. So here I am, I want to observe and measure it. I'm saying, what's the behavior I'm looking at? Um, banging water bottle, very simple. I'm going to take a little frequency count. How many times does he bang a water bottle in a 30 second sample? And what's the consequence of banging the water bottle? The teacher says, put it down, <coughs> put it away, go put it down. Put, put your water bottle down. Go put that away. Put it away. And the child is just banging and banging and banging. I want you to put it away. Put your water bottle away. I can't teach my lesson because you're banging your water bottle. Put your water bottle away. So the other children in the class also have their water bottles. And the little girl sitting next to the teacher says, can't you just listen to him and put your water bottle away? So the teacher reprimands her and says, you're not the teacher. Put the water bottle away. And he keeps... Bang. Now he's increasing the intensity of his banging. He's banging harder and harder and harder, this water bottle. So the teacher gets up and stands near him and says, Don't you hear me? Can't you hear? I'm telling you, put this water bottle away. Can't you hear me? Put your water bottle away. So the child, of course, does not put his water bottle away. But now he's getting all this attention from the teacher. So first, the function of that behavior was, I'm going to avoid the task because I don't want to listen to what you're presenting to me. I'm just going to bang my water bottle. Now I'm getting attention from my peers and attention from my teacher. So what could this teacher have done? He could have ignored it. He could have taken the water bottle away. So the consequence could be, it could be a variety of things. When we consecrate a problem behavior or any behavior, we do it immediately after we present the direction, you know, the directive to the child. Awesome. The teacher knew you were there, right? The teacher knew I was there. So that probably made him not I mean, he could have, <coughs> who knows if Maybe he's he nervous. That if he pulled the bottle away, he might not be something I would have liked to see. Away. You never know, but I can't observe and measure that behavior. Yeah. 
when I'm going to see the teacher. Really, I was looking at the teacher. I was looking. I was looking at the child, but I'm looking at the dynamics of the school and the dynamics of the class. So he gets into this back and forth with the student. Don't you hear me? Can't you hear me? And the child is not listening to him right now, and he's just banging. And now the behavior escalates. So now he elopes from his work area and decides he's going to roll along the floor. So the teacher's trying to get him up and picking him up and trying again and again. So he finally gets him up off the floor. And he's behave now the water bottle was flung across the table. And this boy decides that he will run and dive onto a table that's in the room. Run and dive, run and dive. So this continued for 25 minutes. Uh, and the other children in the room just sat there. So I left. And I spoke to the administration and I said, hi, I'm Lana Bavaro. The parent asked me to come in and take a look at this little boy. Um, can I ask a couple of questions? Question number one, is this a special ed school? No, 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 we're not a special ed school. Well, how many special ed kids are in this class? We're big on inclusion. How many special ed kids are in this class? Six out of eight. I said, okay. I only have eight kids. That's eight kids in the class, six out of eight. I'm not going to tell you the name of the school. I will not. <laughs> I said to the, 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 the administrator says to me, now she's becoming a little bit on edge, of course, and she says, don't people that observe, observe for a full hour? I said, I'm sitting there for 25 minutes to observe a lesson, and I'm not observing a lesson. What I'm observing is a teacher trying his best to engage a child. So he's doing all of these things to engage the child, However, he didn't teach the lesson. The other children in the room were just sitting around. And another boy was also exhibiting some problem behaviors. So the teacher turned away from my student to focus on the other boy and said to him, now you're in trouble and you have to go sit on the side. But the other child was a little bit more compliant. So he got up, took his book, went to the other chair, and sat up on the side. My student continued to up the ante and increase the complexity of his problem behavior. So, of course, I went home and I said to, I, I spoke with the administrator, I spoke with the parents, I said to the parents, really, I would like to write up a treatment plan for your son, but I'm not so confident that they can carry it over. I said, because right now, they have an intervention for him. She said, oh, what, what is it? I said, well, when he exhibits all of these problem behaviors, they give him an opportunity to leave the classroom and walk around the school to decompress, or he can go into a safe room full of sensory stimulation. I said, oh, that's their intervention. Yes, they, they feel like he needs to be, be in a regulated state. So a regulated state is a comfortable place in his, in his own ability, to, and then he can go back into the class to participate in learning. I said, okay, so we have a child that is avoiding learning. That's, what are we observing? Off task behavior. That's okay. where, he, that's avoidance of the task. So the demand that was placed is not being carried out by the child. So what's he allowed to do? Rewarded. He's rewarded. Okay. Right, he gets to go. So 25 minutes of avoiding the demand, which was just take out your, take out your textbook. We're going to start a lesson. So what happened was I created a treatment plan and I gave it to the parents and I gave it to the administrator and I said in as nice way as possible to this administrator, I said, of course I will wait to hear back from you as to whether or not you feel that you're capable of implementing this treatment plan. Okay, we need 36 hours. So needless to say, <laughs> I have not stepped back into the school and the mother's not contacting me but she did say about four days after my observation there, he's doing so much better. I said, great, then you don't need me. You, know, this, you, don't, you don't need my service. Because I know that they realized, after everything I said to them, they really must have realized what the problem is. The pro it's not even the teacher. It's, it's the whole philosophy of the school that they allow students to Avoid work by stepping out into the school and walking around. Now, I noticed when I was sitting there in that school, up and down the halls, children roaming, playing with water bottles, who's curling underneath the desk that's in the hallway, who is um, opening and closing a locker. So all these behaviors were occurring, and I'm 
course, observing all of them and noticing that they are not typical behaviors that should be demonstrated in the school. But they were, and that's what's going to lead us into reinforcement. Behaviors are reinforced. What does the word reinforcement, a reinforcer or a reinforcement means? Reinforcement is a consequence that follows a child's behavior. So the consequence to that particular behavior was, okay, you need to be regulated, go into the hallway, walk around until you're ready and come back. But what happened with that reinforcer? It increased the likelihood of that particular behavior to occur again. The child didn't want to do the lesson. He demonstrated these behaviors. He was rewarded. Now, of course, the teacher didn't think he was rewarding. He was just following the guidelines of the school. If the child feels like he really can't participate in the lesson, he can walk out, gather his thoughts, come back into the classroom, and then be able to participate in your lesson again. Reinforcement. Reinforcement, right? Yes. He is 10 years old, a fifth grader. And it wasn't only him. It was the dynamics of the school. The school itself had that particular well, philosophy. The were that small? They were all that small. It's a very unique environment. So, don't tell me. But <laughs> reinforcement is so powerful. We use reinforcement to shape behavior. We use reinforcement to modify behavior. We use reinforcement to increase appropriate behaviors and decrease inappropriate behaviors. Now, consequences could be positive consequences or negative consequences. And I want to talk about reinforcement, how there's positive reinforcement and there's negative reinforcement. And I don't want you to confuse negative reinforcement with punishment. Negative reinforcement is a good thing. It's not punishment. Punishment is its own thing. So I'll, I'll lean more, in, more into that. Can you go to the next slide for me, please? Thank you so much. Positive reinforcement. You add something pleasant as a consequence to a response. So a behavior you might be looking to modify. I have a little boy right now that we are working very hard to get him to walk outside appropriately with his mother. All she wants is to be able to hold his hand and walk down the street without him pulling away, jumping on the floor, running up to the trees, licking the trees, and he likes to lick the, the um, fences on the side. So we use food reinforcement for him, which is a, called a primary reinforcer. We have tiny little chocolate chips in our pocket. We use that as a motivation and as reinforcement. As he walks, we are on an intermittent schedule, which I'll tell you about, little by little, giving him food. Something we want to get away from quickly because it's, um, it's, not, it's not something that we want to always have the child rely on, so we want to get away from a primary reinforcer. You might use, so we're adding, but when it comes to positive reinforcement, you're adding something. So we're adding that positive primary reinforcer. Favorite songs, I want the child to raise his hand and ask for something, make him, I'm going to have him select a song. That's a behavior we're looking to increase. And I could use singing a song as a reinforcer for him, giving him a favorite toy, um, particular desired sensory input. So those of us that are doing ABA that actually do discrete trial teaching, which is just that aspect of teaching that allows for us to build skills and separate of problem behaviors, but we're just teaching educational concepts like attributes or receptive labels of uh, common objects. We can use any one of these as means of positive reinforcement. We're adding sensory input by taking his arms and jiggling him up and down or squeezing his hands for him or tickling his feet or singing a favorite song. You need to know what your child desires. You need to understand that reinforcement is only reinforcing if it increases the likelihood of that behavior occurring again. So you might think that all children love potato chips. I'm going to use potato chips. But if you have a child that is not tolerating solid food, a potato chip is not a positive reinforcer. It is something that could be aversive. So always know what your child enjoys before you decide you're going to use it as a reinforcer. Okay. Thank you. Negative reinforcement. So two types of reinforcement, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement. Negative reinforcement is a good thing. So many people present this information as punishment. Negative reinforcement, for those of us that have taken the, the exam, no, it's not something bad. It's actually something good. It is a form of reinforcement. So for example, you're removing something that's unpleasant from a situation. So we have a child, let's say, that wants to escape the demands of work. We want him to 
put pegs into a pegboard. Simple task, not motivating for the child. He does not want to do it. So what he does is throw the pegs on the floor, um, rummage them all around in the bucket, put them in his mouth. So these are all problem behaviors that we want to decrease. So what we do is we say to ourselves, how do I get him to complete the task? Well, I want to use a form of negative reinforcement. If he completes the task, now I allow him to escape the demand of work. You work, 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 now you're done and you can do something that you like, which might be engaging in a self-simulatory behavior or just be going and sitting on the couch by himself. Whatever is reinforcing to that child, I don't know. You'll know because you're the clinician. So it's escaping the demand of work. They complete the activity and, and then they can have access to a des desired item in the removal of something that's not desired, like the pegboard or a shape sorter. Like initially when we present these kind of task completions, they're not motivating to the child because they're so effortful or they just don't understand cognitively what to do with it. So what we want to do is we want to teach them how to complete the activity, get it over and done with, and move along to something else. Yes. When you remove something, off, like if the kid has a puzzle and the kid starts throwing the pieces, sometimes I think it's making him nervous that there are so many pieces. So you take pieces away and you only give him a couple, but that's not what you're talking that's about. That's not what I'm talking about because you can't observe and measure nervousness. Try to get that out of your, your head. I don't really mean nervous. I, I know what you mean. Or, or it, could, it could be anything. You know, parents say he's bored, he doesn't want to. He doesn't want to do puzzles, he's bored by that. I can't observe, I can't observe and measure boredom. What I could do is I could say, let me teach him to do something quickly and move along to the next thing. Because in life and in school, he might not want to sit for the social studies lesson, but he has to. Because it's work, it's given, it's part of the plan, it is something that he has to do. Eventually he will do it and then something rewarding will, re rewarding will happen after that. And another thing that I want us to be mindful of is, I, and I see teachers do this all the time, when we observe and measure escaping the demand of work, you have a child that we want him to, I don't know, build with blocks. Could be anything. Put shapes in a shape of a bush sort of build with blocks, put pegs in a pegboard, and the child just swipes them off the table. So what do we do? We say, oh, now you have to go and pick it up. So we make the child go pick it up. We bring them back to the table. They look at you and they go right off the table again. Ah, you gotta clean it up again. He goes and he takes it. How much time is being dedicated to off-task behavior? So what I do with my student is I don't let them get up and get the peg. I have more on the side. And I take the hand and I prompt the peg in and I'm reinforcing even prompted responses because I'm teaching the child work, get it over with, Maybe it's just more fun for him to get up and go get the box and bring it back and get it again. And he's having a good time knocking them off the table, allowing himself to leave, go back and, and do it all over again. So what we want to do is we want to think about behavior and why it occurs. Why is this behavior occurring? It's occurring because he wants to escape the demands of work. Well, I'm not going to let him. I'm going to prompt him through and prompt him through and then deliver reinforcement. So you finished, now you can go and do whatever it is that you want. Listen to your music, have a little fun, jump on the trampoline. It doesn't, doesn't matter what it is. You know, it's, that's particular to the child. But that's a form of negative reinforcement. So out of chair breaks, it's a completion, sensory stimulation that is aversive or noise. Yes? I'm curious, you leave those pets on the floor? I leave them on the floor. And then what? At the, at the end of the activity? Then I get them. Yes. So as I'm prompting him, I'm grabbing the other peg and getting another one. But I always make sure that I have extra on the side. I want this child to complete the task because here's the task. The demand is there. So pegs work, so if it's a puzzle, that won't work because unless you just grab a different puzzle. Grab a different puzzle, grab a different piece. It doesn't matter. It's the completion of the task that we're looking at. Yes? Well, sometimes also I think that if you give a kid a task that ends up being difficult for him or even difficult for him that day or whatever, what I still do is I I rush the ending somehow, but the kid still thinks he finished. Like whether or not yes. we're going to take turns, I'm going to put in, you're going to put in. But of course, I think again that it's important for them to complete. It is. Tip. It is important. So we we use our strategies, right? We might use something called forward cha chaining or backward chaining, where we prompt a few pieces in, and the child just has to put in the last piece of the puzzle. Know your child's ability before you create a targeted skill. So if you have a child that does not like to do puzzles 
or can't do a puzzle, all he has to do to escape the demand of work is put one puzzle piece in or tolerate prompting to get one puzzle piece into a board. Doesn't matter what it is. So long as a child is com being compliant and you have instructional control over the situation and the child then feels Look, I gained access to re reinforcement. Sometimes the completion of the activity is not is what is reinforcing to that child. It's the reinforcer that's reinforcing. So I don't like to do puzzles, but I know that every time I put that one puzzle piece in, you let me play with my squishy ball. That's what I really want. So we need to know our students and really figure out how to always keep them at an optimal level of success. If a child is successful, and gaining access to reinforcement, if you're on task, you cannot be off task. It's as simple as that. The more they do that's appropriate, the less they're doing that's inappropriate. If we have a child that is constantly mouthing, and now we teach a replacement behavior of putting the item in, putting it on, screwing it, it doesn't matter what it is. He's not mouthing, it's an incompatible behavior. So for those of you that have a little bit more background in behavior analysis, there's things called DROs and DRAs and DRIs, and this, these are all different types of reinforcement. So we are reinforcing an alternative behavior, which is your DRA, where you know, if he, instead of him scratching the sides of his cube chair, he has his hands in his lap. It's an alternative behavior. It's also an incompatible behavior, because you can't have your hands in your lap and be scratching at the same time. So I'm going to shape his behavior, which I want him to have his hands in his lap in a learned readiness of, uh, position. So intermittently throughout my session, I'm just delivering reinforcement whenever I see those hands go into his lap. It's all about the reinforcers. Um, think about negative reinforcement. I, I like to give this example because it makes it concrete to us as adults. You know, we, we could identify using negative reinforcement through play with our students, but when we go into our car and we don't put our seatbelt on, we hear ding, 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 ding. That is an aversive sound to us. We don't want to hear that. So what do we do? Well, we, we buckle up. We buckle up right away because I know that the behavior of this stops the aversive sound. It's negative reinforcement. Okay, moving along. Thank you. Different types of reinforcers. Primary reinforcers. So naturally reinforcing items like food and drinks, sometimes we need to, we need to start with primary reinforcers. Uh, as a behavior analyst, I'm not a big fan of using food for many, many reasons. <coughs> Children are on special diets. Children have religious restrictions when it comes to, to food. I was, I'm always told, please don't bring any food into my house. Um, children have difficulty chewing, biting, following, they're tolerating different substances. So I really try to stay away from food reinforcers. But some of our students that we have are on a level where the secondary reinforcer, which is your toy, is not reinforcing yet. But food is. So what I do is I ask the parents to please put something together for me that I could use as a food reinforcer. And if, uh, when I use it, I'm always pairing it with a secondary reinforcer. So the reinforcing component of the food transfers over to the toy that is what's considered a secondary reinforcer. So sometimes we need to start with primary reinforcers when we're teaching new skills or difficult skills. It's a great way to shape behavior if the food itself is reinforcing. Um, M&Ms are not reinforcing for everyone. Yes? They really do. It works. You have to try. It's amazing. If, you, if the child is enjoying the food, they're in, a half, they're in a pleasant state and they're having something that's positive. So what I'm doing is I'm adding a toy next to it and I'm even playing with the toy in front of the child and over time the reinforcing component from the primary reinforcer transfers over to the secondary <coughs> reinforcer and then ultimately I don't need to pair the two of them together. I fade away the food reinforcer and my secondary reinforcer, which really is more socially appropriate if you think about it, becomes in, in, intrinsically motivating to the child when in the beginning only the food is intrinsically motivating, you know, internally motivating for that particular child. What about verbal reinforcement? So verbal reinforcement should also be paired with food and secondary reinforcers as well. I'm glad you brought that up. You always want to use positive 
affect and social praise along with any food you give. Should any it be in lieu of, or it has to go side by side? That's, that depends upon your child. If your child is reinforced by you saying, oh my goodness, you're so terrific, that's great. But if your child is not, it's just like blah, 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 blah. Um, I also find that a lot of therapists, just by habit, we use something called behavior-specific praise. So we say to the child, clap hands, and the child claps hands, and we're like, that's great clapping your hands. The child has a hard time discriminating between the vocal antecedent, which is your SD or your direction, and the reinforcer, if it sounds the same. So if you're saying, do this, and then you want to say, wow, you put your arms up like a big boy. That's a different story. But if you're saying, arms up, that was great putting your arms up. Not reinforcing enough. But basic social praise. Oh, you're terrific. Oh, who's the best guy ever? Pair it with your primaries. Pair it with your secondaries. Because social praise is what we're really leaning to. Oh, my good job. Thumbs up. Whatever works for your student, it's particular to your students. You really do want to vary. I think they have, you could just Google like 101 positive phrases. Some of them are very funny and very, very cute. And saying, good job, good job, good job, good job, that's good job, you're a good boy. That, that's not really what we're looking for. What we want is, we want the child to be motivated by us. We are the main source of reinforcement for them. So we can use tons of positive praise. We could use behavior-specific praise sometimes. Oh, look what you did. You made a circle. Behavior-specific praise. I'm telling the child that I'm proud of what he actually did, which was making that circle. So let's move on to next. Okay. Secondary reinforces, which we touched upon a little bit. Items that acquire reinforcing properties through learning. Praise, money, tokens. We all love our job. But if we weren't getting paid for it, I don't know how many of you would actually still wake up in the morning and go out and do it. I'm not so sure about me. I might just sit home and watch television and eat ice cream all day instead of going out into the field and, and doing trial presentation or modifying problem behaviors. I need secondary reinforcement. So I work. And I tell everyone, we are living in an ABA world. You know, some families don't love the concept of ABA. They would prefer a different methodology. And I say, you're living in our ABA world. You go to work, you get your money, you take your money, and you trade it in for something that you need or something that you want. So that's secondary reinforcement. We, we take our money, we take our praise, we take our tokens, and we trade it in for something else. So some of us like to use token economies, token boards when, we, when we're working, and he works, and he works, and he works, and he works, and then he trades in his token board for Five minutes of free play, a song on the, 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 the CD, that's your secondary reinforcer. In addition to your basic, like, here's your toy or here's a bubble. So after using primary reinforcers that have proven to be successful, we're conditioning other types of reinforcers, like social praise and secondary praise. We're always moving towards the, the more natural type of, of um, praise and reinforcement that we just have in our, in our general environment. Other types of secondary reinforcers, we touched upon it, social praise, wow, you're the best, tangible toys, activity, books, and um, generalization or generalizing where it could be exchanged, money or tokens could be exchanged for something that's more appropriate for the child. And then there's this one, you see it? Automatic self-stimulatory behaviors. Through my career as a behavior analyst, I have kind of like flip flopped back and forth about whether or not to use sensory stimulation as a form of reinforcement. We don't love when our students are engaging in self-stimulation. It's socially inappropriate. We try very, very hard to stop that. But sometimes it's so motivating to the child to be able to do that, that we need to use it. Let me give you an example of one of my students. I was teaching a, a class and the boy, very intelligent boy, he was a self-talker. He liked to talk to himself. He liked to repeat videos, Thomas, Thomas videos, over and over and over again. He, it's, a, it's called scripting, or it's a lady with scripting in it. 
and it was almost impossible to stop. What we did was we created a token system. You work, you work, you work, you work, you take your timer. So this shows you how intelligent this boy was. You set your timer for five minutes and you are allowed to talk to yourself in this particular area. And we just put a little blue circle on the floor where he was allowed to sit and engage in five minutes of self-stimulation. And I, I really, I spent a lot of time thinking about whether or not it was an appropriate form of reinforcement for him. But if he was able to really sustain his attention over time, now I'm not talking about five basic discrete trials. It was you're completing a worksheet and you get one token. You completed a workbook and you get a token. So little by little we increased his time on task throughout the school day, throughout the subject area. And then we allowed him to trade in his main token board to gain access to self-stimulation. So what I did was I put his self-stimulation under my instructional control. You work, you're working, you're working now for 30 minutes, you're working now for one hour, you're working now for two hours, and you get to take your timer and sit for five minutes in a designated area. Yes. And that looks for the school day, but then if you go home and just do it for hours. So he didn't. No. What we did was we worked with the family and we gave them the same blue circle and his mom used it to her advantage as well. But what she did was she only had it in his room. So when he was in his room, he was allowed to self-talk. Anywhere else in the house, he was not allowed to self-talk. And over time, and it was not easy, it took a full year of modifying his behavior. But at the end of the year, this boy understood that he had to control his desire to self-script, um, work appropriately, because he knew at the end of the day he would be able to access what he really wanted, which was to self-talk about Thomas the Tank Engine. And over time, it did not become reinforcing to him. The reinforcing component of it was eliminated because it was under my instructional control. So it was no longer reinforcing. Sorry about the phone. Yes. In a way, does that show that he's able to memorize and maybe could use a memorization for something positive? And we did. We taught him tons and tons of academic skills because his memory was phenomenal. Not only his auditory memory, but his visual memory. And we capitalized on that. And then we taught him to type on the computer, and he typed out the whole Thomas <laughs> the Tank Engine from top to bottom. And he would write, Thomas, T-H-O-M-A-S, T, train. And he would, every single one was meaningful to him. And then he was allowed to take it with him. And what he did, my boy, was take it with him and sit on the school bus and self-stimulate by reading it over and over again. But you know what? That was a lot more appropriate, socially appropriate, than him sitting there and repeating. He was reading it also. Then. He was reading it. Yeah, it took a long time. This, is, yeah. this was an ongoing treatment <coughs> for years with this boy, and the desire to script led to understanding how to read, understanding how to write, understanding how to type. So we really did replace it with more functional skills. Keep the guy who's still the He is not. <laughs> so you have to really know what you're doing when it comes to self-stimulatory behaviors. So some of our younger ones are really not able to, to do all of that, and some behaviors really need to be eradicated. So we don't want it when there's, for example, if the, one of the, the behaviors is rocking, it's not something that we really want to let the child do throughout the day. We replace it with a more functional skill like rocking on a sit and spin or a rocking chair. Okay, thank you. So we're going to do a quick review of reinforcement because reinforcement is so important when we're shaping problem behaviors. Whenever we do a functional assessment of problem behaviors or any behavior that we're looking to increase or decrease, we have to be mindful of the consequence. We understand the antecedent, what happens before the behavior, what the behavior actually is, and then how we're going to change that behavior. We could use a food reinforcer, social praise, token, attention for the child, or automatic reinforcement. Just be mindful of your automatic reinforcers. Schedules of reinforcement. All right, this is tough stuff. 
When we begin to shape behavior, we use something called continuous reinforcement. You do, you get. You do, you get. One after the other. It's a level of one-to-one -one reinforcement. Every occurrence of the targeted behavior is reinforced. If the child were working on appropriate walking, he walks to the corner, he's reinforced. He walks to the next corner, he's reinforced. We're not making him walk to two different corners and then reinforcing him. We're providing the reinforcer contingent upon this particular skill, which is walking appropriately from point A to point B. And then this particular schedule is used when we're teaching new skills, but then after that we want to thin our schedule of reinforcement. This is my favorite type of reinforcement. If you can learn to do this effectively, you can maintain behavior over time. It's called intermittent reinforcement. Not every occurrence of the behavior is reinforced, like eye contact. If I want to teach a child to respond and look, respond and look, and wait for a reinforcer or wait for the vocal SD, the direction given, I'm going to use an intermittent schedule of reinforcement. And it's great for maintaining skills over time. So we have a child that we want to increase eye contact. <clears throat> I went to see a little boy one time recently, and he had an ABA curriculum like this, and tons of academic skills. He knew categories, functions, he understood attributes, prepositions, pronouns, but what he did was this. He sat and he looked at the table, and I watched the teacher working with him, and she presented directions. She said, where's the ball? Where's the big blue ball? Where's the yellow? And he responded and responded and responded and responded and he pointed to each and every one and he touched them. And she was using very vocal direction. Can you find me the can you find me the, the animal? Can you find me the one with the long neck? This child knew everything. But what he never did was look up. He didn't wait for reinforcement. He didn't look for he had no joint attention, no flexible shift of attention. He did not look up. But the teacher was so concerned with him learning, which I understand as a clinician, and responding quickly to a directive that was given, that she was reinforced by his behavior. So she's saying, find blue, find red, find the shape, find the, find the star, find, find me something that's big, find me all the big things. And this child was just right, one right after the other. He never looked. I said, okay, stop right there. We're gonna stop your curriculum. And what we're going to do is we're going to shape his behavior. And we're going to use an intermittent schedule. This boy is never going to know when he's going to get his reinforcer. All he's going to think is, I touch and I look. I touch and I look up. Because <clears throat> maybe she'll give me a reinforcer, maybe not. I don't know. But I'm going to keep demonstrating the behavior that she's looking for. So I was using at the time for him food reinforcement because it's the easiest one to administer and you don't have to take it away when you're teaching a new skill. So started with the basics, and the mother said to me, he knows his colors. I said, I know. He knows his shapes. He knows the animals. He knows the animal sounds already. I said, I know. I'm using this because he knows it. I'm not teaching him a new academic skill. I'm teaching him what he should be doing. He should be responding and looking and waiting for my reinforcer. So we started with very simple. Find the square. Oh. And I waited, and he looked up. And instead of presenting another direction to him, like on the ball, I delivered a reinforcer for eye contact. And sometimes I said, but you're looking at me so nicely. And sometimes I said, who's the best guy ever? It didn't really matter. What I was just doing was shaping behavior. I identified the problem. The problem was he had no joint attention. He just did not know that he should look up for recognition. The, the communicative partner was there, but there was no communication. It was just single <laughs> some responding. So what we did was over time, he responded, he looked, I gave a reinforcer. Respond, look, I gave a reinforcer. Then I thinned my schedule of reinforcement. Every two trials, every three trials, every four trials. Sometimes I waited. He looked. I gave him a reinforcer. The mother said, why are you reinforcing? You didn't ask him to do anything. Look, but he spontaneously made eye contact with me. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to reinforce him whenever I want to, just for looking up. So this boy over time, and it happened within two sessions, he figured out how smart that he should look, respond, look back again. 
behavior was shaped. Intermittent reinforcement. For us as adults, I don't know how many of you like to go to gamble to Atlantic City. That's all about intermittent reinforcement. I pull the lever, or I think now it's like you hit a button, you don't even pull the lever anymore. And I don't know when I'm going to win. So I put the money in and I press the button, I put the money in and I press the button, I do it again and again and again. And then all of a sudden, after this 50th time, out comes all this money. I'm reinforced for putting money in. So what do I think? I'm going to do it again. I'm going to win again. Put the money in, I put the money in. Because the whole entire system of Atlantic City is. It's, it's determined by intermittent reinforcement. People don't know when they're going to be reinforced. So they do the behavior again and again and again. Right. The behavior plans your next. <laughs> <laughs> I think they thought of it long before my time. But this is a way to reinforce not only eye contact, but anything you want. We have children that we, we use negative reinforcement with, right? We tell them, go take a break. But when I call you back, you're not coming back. Why? Because every time I call you back, I have another demand for you. So I taught you, whenever Lana says, come sit down, there's another task. So why would he do it? You know what he's going to do? He's going to start running. He's running away. I'm saying, Jack, come sit down. And he's, you're the lady that's going to make me sit, and I'm going to have to do something else that I don't want to do. So I would rather run through my whole house, have you come chase after me. So what I did was I used intermittent reinforcement. I said to him, Jack, come sit down. I prompted him to sit, and I let him go again. Go take a break. He's like, what are you talking about, go take a break? You didn't ask me to do anything. I said, oh. when I ask you to come, sometimes you come and you get a cookie. Sometimes you come and I let you go back out. Sometimes you come and you have to do work. He's not going to know. So what is he going to do? He's going to listen. He's going to come. Every time I say, come sit down, he's going to come sit down. Because he's never going to know when that reinforcer is coming. Intermittent reinforcement, very powerful. Different frequencies of reinforcement. So for those of us that have gone through hours and hours of education to become behavior analysts, there's about 70 questions about reinforcement and ratios. We become very fancy in how we put our pl treatment plans together. We do things like an FR, a fixed ratio of one, fixed ratio of two. Um, every time he does two things for me, I'm going to reinforce him. Every time he does three things for me, I'm going to reinforce him. Very specific types of reinforcement. Some of our students pick up on it. They pick up on fixed ratios. You have to be careful. I would rather use this kind. It's called a varied ratio. Mm -hmm. So child doesn't know. It's, it's, it's like the step before intermittent reinforcement. Child says, I don't know when the reinforcer is coming. I guess I'll imitate, I'll imitate, I'll imitate, and I give a reinforcer. That's when you want to build upon fluency of your trials or increase the, the particular skill that you're looking for, which is, let's say, raising hands. So we have a child in the class, and the behavior we want to decrease is calling out. We want to increase raising the hand. So he raises his hand one time. He doesn't get called on. He raises his hand again. He doesn't get called on. Third time he raises his hand, he gets called on by the teacher, which is what he really wants. He wants to talk about whatever it is that he wants to talk about. So it's a variable ratio. So we tell the teacher ahead of time, we let him raise his hand twice before you call him. Let him raise his hand two to three times. Let him, you know, sometimes call him upon him the first time he raises his hand. Sometimes really make him wait three times. Have two other kids respond before him. That's a varied ratio that he's not going to know. Discretion is left up to us as a therapist or the teacher to determine when we want to deliver that reinforcement. And um, and it's just some, did lots of different kinds of reinforcement over here. I know really focusing on it, but it's the, the foundation of how we shape and change behavior. We have different types of ratios. We have our fixed ratio, we have our variable ratio, and then we have this it's called differential reinforcement. It's an amazing thing if you can figure out how to use it, especially for speech pathologists. So for those of you that are speech and language pathologists that help design our ABA programs, such as sound imitation, verbal imitation, sound blending program, oral motor imitation. What we want to do for you is help the child practice what it is that whatever particular sound. So if we're working on mm and ah and e and o, oh, we might have child that can kind of say them, but not so clear. The articulation is off. What we could use is differential reinforcement principles. If I'm using a food reinforcer, 
If I say, say, mmm, and you say, mmm, I'm going to give you a big chip. If I say, say, mmm, and you say, mmm, I'm going to give you a little chip because you did imitate me, but I didn't get eye contact. So the quality of the responding starts to shape over time because I'm differentially reinforcing that child. You might ask a question. What's this? Child says, cup. I give a reinforcer. Could be anything. Could be a little bit, a little bit of music doesn't matter what it is so long as it's reinforcing to that child. I say, what's this? And he says, that's a cup. Better response. I'm going to give you more time to listen to your music. So we're, you, we're shaping his behavior by using reinforcement in a very special way. We're using differential reinforcement principles. So as I find that differential reinforcement works so well with speech and language programs. I use it for social questions. What's your name? And the child says, Julia. And I say, oh, well, okay. And reinforce the child. She said, Julia. So did she say Julia? Was she looking? She's saying, my name is Julia. Because I know she could use a full sentence, but she tends to just answer in a single word utterance. Or maybe she's not looking, and I know that she's capable of really making eye contact when she, pre when she responds to that particular question. I'm going to use my differential reinforcement principles. So... We, different differential reinforcement, we use primaries for a new skill. We try not to use the primary reinforcement for prompted trials. So that, I'm sure that makes perfect sense. If I have to help you to do it, I don't want to use a high level reinforcer. If I, I get you to do it independently, I will use a higher level reinforcer. Give better reinforcement for better responding if the child completes the puzzle. I put in record time, but we know our students. We know how long it takes them to actually do something. We can kind of gauge as to how long an activity takes. If, um, if he could generally do that puzzle in two minutes and now he's taking seven minutes, I'm gonna let him go out of his chair to play, but I'm gonna call him right back. Um, if, he, if I give him the puzzle and he completes the puzzle in two minutes or under two minutes and it's the best I've ever seen him because there's no off-task behaviors. He's not dropping the pieces. He's not falling out of his chair. He's not putting the piece and then stopping to manipulate to look at the pieces or analyzing each piece. All of those off-task behaviors that we look to eliminate interfere with completion of tasks, interfere with learning or playing appropriately. So what we need to do is shape behavior using differential reinforcement. Complete that puzzle. The faster you are, the more reward you're going to get. There's something called Premax Principle. Again, this is great for speech pathologists, especially those of you that do feeding. We pair a preferred activity with a less preferred activity. So you always hear, as parents, we tell our children, you finish your dinner, then you could have dessert. That's Premax Principle. Do something that's not so favorable to you, and you'll get something even better. Very simple type of um, philosophy over here. We can use this. We don't give our children ice cream before dinner. We don't give it to them during dinner. We wait for dinner to be complete and then we give it to them because we're shaping their behavior to be compliant and follow the demand that we're requesting, which is just eat your chicken nuggets and then you can have whatever it is, a sour stick if that's what you really want. So I put in as an example, listening to music could be reinforcing after cleaning up your toys. The key to Premax principle is to require the completion of the less preferred activity. That's very, very important. And parents, parents don't always um, recognize that they're kind of giving in. And therapists too, we really don't recognize that we're giving into the situation and the child is not really waiting. They're not waiting to complete the activity before they gain access to the reinforcer. Sometimes we, we have to motivate them, we'll put it on the table. And I know you really want to play, I really want those, you really want those bubbles, but you have to clean up your blocks in order for you to get those bubbles. The bubbles are there for you, but I'm not going to blow bubbles while you're cleaning up. It doesn't work that way. It's one and then the other. In order to properly use reinforcement to shape behavior, when we have identified behaviors that we want to modify, we need to conduct what's called a preference assessment. And this is very important because we don't always do it because we think to ourselves, I know what he likes. He loves my toys. He loves, he loves these particular books. He loves these particular snacks. But what we need to be mindful of is that just like 
our desires change over time, so do our students. And our students might like something one day, but not necessarily the other. Or they might not like something one day, and then like it the next day. I had a little boy that I work with, a baby. And I took out a C and say, you pull the level down and it makes animal sounds. I wanted him to just acclimate to me and sit in the room and play with me and, and become comfortable with me. So what did I do? I had my bag of toys. I took out the C and say, I put it to Old McDonald had a farm. I pulled the lever down and this child ran as quickly as he could out of the room. So fast that he trampled over his little sister to get to the mom who was outside the room. And I said, I scared him. Look what I said, I'm so sorry, I scared him. She's like, he loves how McDonald's has a farm. I said, not on this toy, he doesn't. So I said, okay, I wanna, I need to do better at conducting a reinforcer inventory or for a preference assessment. Mom said, but he loves how McDonald's had a farm. I said, okay, so what am I gonna do? Okay, I wanna use this toy. I like this toy. There's so many things. I take the animals, I put them on, I give them a ride, I let the child point to the animal. It's a great way to teach animal ID, animal sounds, motor coordination. There's so much you can do with a tiny little C and say. I want to use it in my sessions, but I can't even take it out because now he comes back into the room and I'm showing him, no more. I put it in the bag, I close the bag. You don't have to have it. And the poor little guy is like this, looking, looking over his shoulder for that. So I said, I'm not going to introduce it that session. My next session with him, of course I have it. And he's looking for it because he remembers. Mm -hmm. She's got that scary thing in the bag. So what I did was I took it out and I left it in the room. And he watched it. The whole session, he looked over to see. <laughs> and I said, it's broken. It's broken. We're not going to use that there. It's just going to stay over there. But I want to change his desire to play with this. I want to use this as an educational tool for him. My third session. Loves old McDonald had a farm. So I put on my phone. Actually, no, I didn't. Third session, I sang it. I sang old McDonald and I pulled the toy closer to me. Still didn't matter. He was having one foot out the door. He was panicked over. He thought I was going to use it. My fourth session, I put. Every child loves a phone, right? They all love their, their little iPad and their phones that I put. Oh, McDonald's. And I took the toy and I put my phone directly on top of my toy. And I said, so McDonald's, oh, McDonald's, oh, McDonald's, back and forth. And then I turned it on. And he was scared, but he didn't run. Because he realized it's the same phone. Oh, so McDonald's, oh, McDonald's. And over time, I, by, the, by the next session, I was able to really use it for him. Because I was able to to shape his behavior and have it be part of a preference for him. <coughs> when we're teaching new skills, we're using continuous reinforcement. I know I mentioned that to you earlier. We want to pair all our primary reinforcers with secondary reinforcers. And we want to deliver reinforcement immediately and contingent <coughs> upon the targeted response. I want to just give you a quick example of delivering reinforcement. Why do we conduct a preference assessment? We want to know what's reinforcing to the child. I need to use these reinforcers to shape behavior and to eliminate problem behaviors. So I have them by me, and I'm working to get this child to stop banging everything. So um, I teach him to put simple thing. Instead of banging a block on a table, I take the block, I put it in the bucket, or I take the shape, and I put it in the shape sorter. And once he does it, I have my reinforcer, and I immediately give him a reinforcer. It's immediately paired, contingent upon that particular behavior, because I'm replacing the banging with something functional by putting the block in the bucket or the, the shape in the shape sorter. And there's my reinforcers. Sometimes I'm taking too long, I realized. By the time I turn, rummage through my bag, give it to him, other things have occurred. So he took the block back out, he banged it, and then I gave the reinforcer to him. So I taught him, oh, I didn't want you to block in, I wanted you to bang. So I worked against myself in that way. I said, I have to really be faster. I have to have the reinforcer ready, because the second he demonstrates the behavior I'm looking for, I want to reinforce it, immediately reinforce it, immediately reinforce it, again and again and again, until it becomes a learned behavior. 
So I deliver my reinforcement immediately. And for those of our students that engage in a significant amount of self-stimulatory behaviors, which could be anything, it could be flapping, it could be rocking, it could be vocal stereotypy where they're just talking, you know, self-talk. Sometimes between the targeted skill and our reinforcer, even if it's two seconds, something could occur. You have to be fast, you have to be ready, you have to know what's reinforcing, because sometimes this is more reinforcing than whatever it is that I have, the squishy ball. So that's why I see some therapists, they'll, they'll keep reinforcers on top of the table. I don't love it, but I do understand why it's necessary at times, because we need to be fast. So it has to be, do this, he claps his hands, he gets a reinforcer before he could tense up and do that. So please be mindful when you deliver your reinforcers that you really, really are reinforcing what you should be reinforcing, which is this particular skill that you're looking for. And what happens if you delay your reinforcer? So we talked about having your reinforcement be immediately targeted with the skill. If you delay your reinforcers, you can accidentally reinforce something else. If he claps and then coughs and you give him a little more, you could try coughing. It has happened. It, 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 I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen everything. <laughs> I've seen so many things. About, you know, a kid that clears his throat, or a little boy, that that was his behavior. <clears throat> and it was so, the frequency was so, so high. And it was so difficult to reinforce that. So we did other things, like verbal drills with him. And as we're saying, say mm, say ah, say e, because you can't say e if you're clearing your throat at the same time. Say mm, ah, e, oh, there's your reinforcer. So we, we use fluency to our advantage in that capacity. That <laughs> I, I'm imitating, imitating sounds. Developing what's called an echoic repertoire where we say, I say, you say, I say, you say. Punishment. It's not negative reinforcement. Don't get it confused. Punishment is something we don't use for skill building. We're not using punishment. It's not, I knock the blocks off the table and you make me go clean it up. And then you say, clean it up again, clean it up again. It's called an overcorrection procedure. It's something that's used with behavior analysts sometimes, but it is form of punishment. We don't need to do that for building skills. We prompt correct responding, reinforce correct responding. We don't need to use punishment. Use correction procedures such as errorless teaching. Give you a quick example of errorless teaching. When we're doing our discrete trials, those of us that are doing ABA are doing discrete trials for teaching. Errorless teaching, touch your nose. The child touches his head, that's your nose. There's nothing in between. It's I'm gonna show you what it is. We could use a no-no prompt. Sometimes we do that. Find the ball. Nope, find the ball. Nope, find the ball. That's the ball over there. Find the ball, there it is. So you're using no for those, those of our students that have the whole concept of deductive reasoning. That's not the ball, maybe that one is the ball. But if you have a child that doesn't have that, find the ball, no, find the ball. No, it's the same one, it doesn't matter. Don't use no, no prompt, just use errorless at that point. And for any kind of behavior management, you wanna follow the protocol. Behavior analysts will not use punishment, should not use punishment, unless positive behavioral practice has Everything has been tried, utilized, whatever, whatever you want to call it. We, we really want to exhaust every positive behavioral practice that we know before we opt for punishment. In some clinical settings, punishment is necessary. Sometimes um, young adults or children are really hurting themselves and you can't spend that much time on positive behavioral practice before we have a child that ends up in a hospital. So we do use punishments at that point. For those of us that use timeout, I don't know if you've seen it in your classrooms, I'm sure you have. You've seen teachers use timeout, that is a form of punishment. We don't use it, it's not something we ever use whether it's an inclusionary timeout where you're actually sitting with the child in the classroom or exclusionary timeout, like you need to, to leave the room. We have schools that use it. It's not something that we want to participate in as behavior analysts. We prefer not to use timeout. Timeout many times is used the wrong way. Timeout should only be used for it when a behavior is to access attention, not because you hit your friend. 
So you hit your peer, now you're in timeout, you have to sit on the side. It doesn't really work that way. So just to, to kind of sum up as quickly as possible, when we're looking at behavior, first and foremost, we need to observe and measure it. If we know what we're looking at, we can find out what the function is of that behavior. Once you find out the function, that's when you capitalize on your reinforcement, reinforcement principles. The reinforcement is going to shape your behavior to either decrease a problem behavior or increase a behavior that you're really looking to have the child maintain. Um, I put questions or comments because I thought if we have some extra time, if anyone wants to just bring up any problem behaviors that they have come in contact with that maybe they need some assistance with, you know, we're all here, we're all, we're all therapists and clinicians, maybe we could kind of brainstorm together. If there's any concerns? If not, I'll think of one. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. If you have any other questions, you can come And we have Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.